question is how can wisdom and compassion guide us at the moment of death especially when we are sick and bedridden so that we can attain a good rebirth i think that's one part of the question the other part is how do we balance spiritual life with worldly life using compassion and wisdom as a family man working hard to support the family during this difficult so there are basically two two questions for you thank you uh, for these two questions i think uh, it it is two questions that are very deep eh? <laughs> in themselves uh, could be the topic of uh, your next topic <laughs> for, for, a, for a sunday morning eh? but briefly when we talk about using wisdom and compassion to guide us correctly at the moment of death my my straight away response is actually we have to prepare for the moment of death now so is actually every day every day we remind ourselves that is a certainty and the timing is uncertain so every day even as i go to bed my last meditation at night yeah i'm reminded that i might not wake up tomorrow morning <laughs> i might die peacefully in my sleep <laughs> so to to bring in wisdom and compassion to guide us is to guide us every day how we deal with the endings of each day for example when this webinar dies yeah at uh, um, my time 1:30 your time 11:30 we're all going to be going our separate paths that's the death of this webinar how do we end this webinar yeah how do we help ourselves to say goodbye that is part of managing death so we we actually have to practice wisdom and compassion regularly and then when as this good question is saying when we are sick when we are bedridden when we are in some degree of physical and mental pain yes because we've learned how to live because we've learned through dying regularly we learn how to live then at the moment of death we are well equipped hopefully for our next life yeah um but i don't think we we should be just concentrating on the on the result of a good river i think we just continue to practice wisdom and compassion as we do every day yeah with regards to the second question how do we balance spiritual life with worldly life using compassion and wisdom as a family man working hard to support the family during this difficult covid-19 period um the simple underlying answer is um we do not compartmentalize our wisdom and compassion only in one area in our life actually uh, my work life i practice as much wisdom and compassion as i can at home i practice as much wisdom and compassion as i can right now with all of you this is halfway between work and home and family and private life i still practice as much wisdom and compassion as i can so in that sense it's a balance but in that sense is to bring to the forefront wisdom and compassion wherever i am whoever i'm with that is the way to have that balance yeah thank you for the two questions yeah thank you dr tan there's another question uh, this one is uh, when when one is in depression or trauma or there's a self suicidal mode how could one still use wisdom to cultivate all this negative despite all these negativities wow this is a very deep 
clinical question. <laughs> um, and it's a very good time for me to invite uh, Sister Mian and Brother Chenka uh, to help me with this, uh, especially for your Malaysian audience. Uh. What would you say, uh, Sister Mian? How would you respond to this very practical, in depth question? Whilst we wait for Mian, perhaps I could. Yes, yes, invite, that sound, uh, you know, this is tough. But uh, for me, it's uh, again back to what you said. If whatever little practices issue that we have, even in troubled times, if we could only just bring that softness, that compassion, that kindness to ourselves, then you know, hopefully, we can actually face the depression and trauma uh, much more better. Can you guys hear me? Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. then maybe it's something wrong with my second system. So maybe Chinka, you help me to take over. Chinka, are you there? Yes, yeah. I'm here. Uh, okay, I think we can hear you fine. That's good. Uh, how to apply wisdom and compassion when we are depressed traumatized or suicidal. Uh, mm. Just a short response, as uh, Dr. Tan mentioned, is a very deep, profound question, very clinical. If, uh, you, if you need an in-depth answer, it's usually in a therapy setting. Uh, but I'll try to give a brief and useful response. Uh, applying uh, compassion will be, I think, more relevant in this context, more self-compassion. So we are, we are in a depressed state, suicidal state, traumatized state is important to remind ourselves that we are not alone. We are not the only one depressed. We are not the only one traumatized. We are not the only one suicidal. There are many, many people who are facing the same situation. Uh, so in a way, we are using self-compassion to suit ourselves, to comfort ourselves, to remind us this is a common humanity. As long as we are not enlightened, we will, we will experience this uh, negative emotions are on and off. So that is the compassion part, specifically is the self-compassion. Uh, then the wisdom part is to understand that everything happens with causes and conditions. We are depressed, we are suicidal, we are hurt, we are disappointed, we are a lot of causes and conditions. So we remind ourselves that this will also pass. Uh, this will also pass. And then we focus on what we can do. There are a lot of things which are not within our control, but there are also little, little things that we can do. That to, to, to change the causes and the condition. Yeah, so that's the brief response. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. Thank you, Mian and Chenka. So well responded. Dr. Tan, you have anything you want to add on? No, no. Let's move on to the next okay. question. Uh, the third question is um, okay, how do you encourage an elderly person who is in, in anger all the time, all right, uh, who feels helpless? and find that his life is not worth living anymore? Uh, well, the, the, the question keeps on running, let me see. <laughs> I'm missing the question now. Let's start uh, practicing self-reflection. Yeah, 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 correct, correct. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Wan Yu Gong. Yu Gong, yes, Wan Yu Gong. A very detailed question. Self-reflection, yes. Yeah. If I keep in mind that you're suggesting encouraging, and this is an elderly person, and the main symptom or problem seems to be anger, anger. And the anger could be coming from the very deep helplessness huh, of this old person, elderly person. And then there is also this suicidal bit which overlaps the, the previous question that this old, older person, elderly person, is already finding life not worth living. Uh, perhaps because all his anger is, is still ongoing eh? and, and his helplessness is not since yesterday, it's, it's for many, many years now. And then you bring up the real question, the real challenge in your question, you go, how to start practicing self-reflection. Now, 
how do we help someone to start self-reflecting when they are towards the end of their life and they've already, in a way, felt life has never been worth living and it's because of all the anger, which presumably, keeping in mind, anger is always a secondary feeling. Eh? The, the first feeling is usually hurt. When I'm hurt, I get angry, but I might not get in touch with my hurt. I just jump to my anger. The other one is fear. When I'm angry, I, I get angry because underlying it, I'm actually frightened. And helplessness might be in the area of fear for this person. But instead of feeling the fear, accepting the fear, dealing with the fear, the anger just comes up. Yeah? So when I, and you notice, I'm, I'm going through diagnosis here from your very good case that you are presenting, challenging all of us. From my diagnosing from your good data provided, I would suggest that as a therapist or as a relative of a friend, uh, we first have to be the compassionate, empathic listener. So if this person is still talking and still wants to talk to someone and you are the someone, this is your opportunity to listen, 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 and perhaps ask open-ended questions that gets to the anger and what's below the anger, the helplessness, the fears, and to accompany this elderly person respectfully, gently, tenderly, compassionately, to accompany him, to understand and accompany him in his desperateness. Because this is also getting close to the end of a lifetime. I think if we can just do that, uh, that session itself will be helping this elderly person. But of course, it's, it's not over by just one session. So I would also want to help the person, remind the person, if it is yourself, you got to remember that this elderly person needs a good listener, not just once, but regularly. Yeah? And, and maybe he, he can approach several people, including perhaps yourself, and then choose who's the one that he feels uh, understands him best, yeah, uh, without judgment. And, and then he might receive at least ongoing sessions, if you like, from this good listener. Uh, that is my uh, practical response to your very good and detailed question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Okay, there's another question here. Uh, this is from Bobby. Is it true that when one is nearing death, they will see spirits of their lost loved ones hindering on their past memories? Yeah, this is a question uh, better <laughs> conveyed to your next Sunday's uh, meeting when uh, Bante Sujato, Ajahn Sujato is with yourself. This is an area where our Sangha members can help us best. Yeah? So is it true when one is nearing death, they will see the spirits of their lost loved ones uh, hindering, I suppose, not hindering, hindering on their past memories. Mm, is, it, is it hindering, Bobby? Yeah. They were sisters. Yeah, on their past memories. Well, if I might contribute uh, merely as a coming from being a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, uh, we are aware uh, from reports from people who have had, had a near-death experience. Everybody thought they were dying and they were dying, but they didn't die and they came back. And some of them have actually reported, most of them have reported uh, that they see a light and they're approaching the light. A smaller number have reported that they see spirits like angels and even a smaller number have reported that they see 
uh, their loved ones who have passed away. They actually get a glimpse of them. And very, very, very few still has reported that there's a message from the light or the loved ones to say, your time is not right yet. You got to go back. <laughs> it's not your time to die yet. <laughs> um, so that's as far as I know from first-hand reports of uh, someone nearing death and almost dying to see the spirits of their lost. Mm -hmm. If the person is not actually in the dying process, yeah, and they are seeing spirits of their lost loved ones, um, I think that's another area perhaps based on the belief of their spirits around us right now. Right now, the spirit of my deceased father on this, on this Father's Day is with me, you know. So as soon as uh, Mian mentioned in one of the her contributions on the chat box this morning, reminding all of us it's Father's Day, I, I felt the spirit of my father with me in that sense, yeah. Um, but I don't know about hindering our past memories. Is it, is it, Bobby, are you referring to hindering us using our past memories in a useful way? Um, yeah, we're, we're not sure what, what you meant by kindering on the past memories. It's not sure about what that means. Yeah, I'm not sure. Are you there, Bobby? Or is it from someone else? It's from someone else. I'm, I'm just copying and pasting from Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah. from one of what is what means, actually? Kindering. Yeah, if, if that person can speak up or, or type in, that'll be good. If not, let's move on to the next question. Yes, the next question is uh, the Dhammapada verse 282, uh, wisdom from meditation. This is one way to increase wisdom. Is there any other ways? Well, Benny, what is the Dhammapada 282 wisdom? Uh, it's about the uh, attaining wisdom through, through meditation. Can, uh -huh. uh, can one attain wisdom through meditation? Yeah. But that's, that's the obvious one, which I also referred to in my talk just now. Eh? As we meditate, as we self-reflect uh, deeper and deeper, both in the therapeutic session, counseling session, as well as in our meditations, especially during retreats, eh? when we have a lot of time, a lot of space to go deeper in our self-reflection, that is certainly a very powerful way of self-understanding, which increases our wisdom, yeah? Uh, is there any other simple way? Well, the, the simplest way, in a sense, and the most usual way is our lived experiences. Now, as I'm living this webinar, this Zoom meeting with all of you, I'm also learning from your wisdom. I'm also collecting the wisdom of this whole group. And is, and is helping me. So in our lived, intimate, meaningful interactions with fellow sentient beings, I think that is our living wisdom that we can collect every day. But provided we, we attune ourselves to it, provided we, 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 we are in the intimacy in the interrelatedness, yeah? And, and we are having a, a sufficient degree of capacity to modulate how we are feeling right now and to be able to remain mindfully with others in the room. Um, and wisdom will naturally arise. Yeah? And all the counselors and therapists do in their session time is, is to create a facilitating environment in the therapy counseling room that the two individuals, the, the counselor, the, the psychiatrist and the patient or the client can mutually be in the core mindfulness that wisdom and compassion naturally arises. And it's very simple and it's very ordinary. That's how I would uh, respond to this very good question. 
And the next question is on euthanasia. Yep. Is euthanasia part of compassion to help the dying not to prolong his suffering? Do we suffer the negative karmic energy of killing in euthanasia, even though with good intentions? Um, I might invite uh, Dr. Pang Chingka to address this one, um, especially from and I imagine this is a question from someone who regularly attends uh, Buddhist uh, meetings like this in uh, Malaysia. And I would suspect that this is a question that has been raised in past meetings. And Dr. Pong will be the best to res give it the first response. Could you, Tinka? Sure, I'll try the response. Uh, the, the word euthanasia may mean different things to different people. Mm. Of course, uh, in Malaysia, euthanasia is not accepted. You cannot go to a hospital and request for euthanasia. Uh, that, the meaning of euthanasia is like is, uh, doing something actively to end the person's uh, life. Uh, that is not, I'm not sure in Australia, but in Malaysia, the, that is not permissible. Uh, you can't tell the doctor to give something to my loved ones to end the pain and the suffering of compassion. That's not the, uh, that's, that cannot be done in Malaysia. Uh, so that was quite straightforward. Uh, however, some people use the word inter, uh, euthanasia to mean not to prolong suffering. Not to prolong suffering is different from actively ending the person's life. Uh, not to prolong suffering means uh, uh, it is somewhere along palliative care. Uh, palliative care is, is doing our best uh, to make the dying process as comfortable as possible, not actively treating, not to give any the unnecessary intervention uh, and just allow the person to pass on uh, as comfortable as possible. Uh, that, that is the second meaning of uh, euthanasia. Uh, to me, the second, that second meaning of euthanasia it is a wise thing to do. It's a compassionate thing to do. It's a wise thing to do. We allow the person to go off uh, peacefully. The intention that are rooted in wisdom and compassion. Therefore, there is no bad karma involved, no negative or bad karma involved. Uh, of course, the, I, these two situations are given that they, they are very straightforward situations. But very often in, in life, uh, there's a lot in between. It. You're, you're breaking up. Chinka. I think the, the uh, internet line is, is breaking up. The and also wise friends. That's related to uh, yeah, practical wisdom to discuss with our wise friends. Uh, can you? Uh, uh, so in summary, it's uh, actively killing No, I think we are not hearing you. So oh, in, in summary, thank you, Chenka. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'll just say that, thank you, Chenka. Um, I fully concur with what you say. Um, and I'm glad you make that distinction between active and passive euthanasia, which answers the question really. The Dalai Lama has replied to these questions at meetings exactly the way you did, Chenka emphasizing what is the intention behind the passive euthanasia, helping the person to die, when the intention is out of compassion to reduce the suffering, to reduce the yeah, unbearable pain, even with the last breath. Now, when the intention is good and correct and skillful, then that passive euthanasia is, is common sense in fact, yeah? and it's okay, and there's no bad karma arising from it. Um, with your reference to Australia, it's very interesting. Um, there are two states in Australia that has legalized euthanasia, and New South Wales is still debating in the New South Wales government to join the other two states, and there's a big push to legalize euthanasia. Now, the legality is there are lots of other factors involved here, yeah? and it's quite complicated. Um, but again, uh, the push towards euthanasia is actually following what Chenka and what the Dalai Lama has emphasized. 
it is all based on it is arising out of good intentions it should be allowed legally as well thank you thank you uh, we have uh, a comment from mian because early on we we couldn't hear her i think uh, she has posted uh, what her, her response maybe i'll just read it out uh, she says that i recite this aspiration which uh, from our late uh, kesri damananda every night as preparation for death if i have stayed straight sorry if i have strayed from the true path may i never do it so again if i have carelessly hurt someone today by word or deed may i be more mindful the next time o buddha the enlightened one help me to set my heart right may my actions reflect your love and compassion i shall strive to cleanse my heart from hate and envy and live in harmony with all people i shall be close to the dharma in good as well as in difficult times i know that should the moment come for me to leave the world i shall do so without fear or regret because i leave the world a better person than when i came into it whatever wrong someone may do to me may i be compassionate and forgive and bear no hatred in my heart i shall bear in mind to be grateful for the acts of love and consideration shown to me no matter how small they appear to be for those i love and those who love me may this life be a blessing and a source of happiness to all beings namo buddhaya thank you so much mia for your beautiful words thank you thank you sadhu 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 okay. okay i think we have we can have uh, maybe one or two more questions yes uh, there's one here from uh, from yime you say from my personal experience metta chanting or loving kindness meditation really helps during difficult times especially in cultivating acceptance and compassion well i think she's just making a making a statement and yeah. endorsing what you have, you have explained so it's not really a question right if i might just give a quick response yes yeah, please, please with regards the meditative psychotherapy and practicing mm. at the end of the session when i ask my patients which one of the four would you like to choose to attend to the whatever has come up in this session guess what it's always the loving kindness that's the most popular mm. is exactly what you say you may the loving kindness meditation is is the one that is most needed most of the times uh, when we are suffering thank you for highlighting it okay maybe we have we'll take two more questions how can we help children cultivate wisdom can wisdom be taught to children Oh yes most definitely we can help children cultivate wisdom there are different components of wisdom not wisdom in the adult sense yeah but if you look at the five six components of wisdom that i've talked about especially the the compassion part of wisdom and the empathy part of wisdom yeah uh, and this is being taught through mindfulness classes for school children in sydney in australia in wollongong near nantian institute in america in many primary schools now and i would think so in southeast asia as well uh, uh, my my two grandchildren who are attending catholic schools um, they actually teach mindfulness in the in the in the primary school and in the teaching on mindfulness they also cultivate uh, patience yeah uh compassion together with the mindful exercises so these are the components of wisdom through mindfulness practices that has arrived in the school for children and as parents and grandparents we can always encourage and add to it thank you for your question joe good i think we have one one more question uh when one is having dementia they will soon lose their wisdom and get irritated with one's own life 
So how do you overcome this? Thank you for this question from someone from the five groups that are linked to us. Yeah, the Facebook Live. Yeah. yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, when one is having dementia, um, the dementia itself doesn't necessarily make us lose the wisdom. Eh? Um, it is not the majority, it is the minority that can get irritated. Yeah? Um, and even get very upset or angry uh, when they're suffering dementia. One would argue, one would like to consider that if we are already cultivating and practicing wisdom and compassion as much as we can in our daily life, and wisdom and compassion, we also find, according to Dr. Jess as well and research as well, actually increases as our age advances. Uh, Dr. Dilip Jess, who wrote the book entitled Wiser that I showed you just now, one of the reasons he specialized in researching wisdom was he, he found out that the, the basic belief we have that the older we are, the wiser we are, is actually scientifically researched and found to be true. So in fact, as we get older, we are naturally wiser and we have actually more wisdom and the compassionate capacity within us. And that's why nowadays, they, in certain parts of uh, America, they actually build the old folks home, the nursing home next door to the primary schools. And they get the members in the nursing home to visit next door the primary school children. And the primary school children come to visit the nursing home as well. And they even coined the term grandma wisdom. And this has also been researched in families where the three generations live together and they find that the children grow up with much more wisdom and compassion because of the influence of grandma and grandpa living with them, who themselves have acquired more wisdom and compassion. So it is the minority, sadly, because of um, dementia, um, that the not so attractive aspects of their personality, yeah? So this is perhaps someone who, who already uh, is easily irritated, but with dementia, the irritation becomes worse. How to overcome this? Well, again, it's in the area of emotional balance and from the world of Buddhism, again, it would be meditation, 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 mindfulness, practice of mindfulness, one minute techniques, five minute techniques to anchor ourselves with the breath. Uh, from the world of psychology, all the systematic desensitization, all the relaxation exercises will apply here. So thank you for bringing up the topic of dementia. We got four more minutes. Maybe we just take one last question. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is one question about, uh, well, it's, it's worded as uh, able to find one's purpose or direction in life or not being able to find this yet. Does this ability fall on IQ, EQ, SQ, WQ? <laughs> what psychological ailment is this? How can one enhance this ability to identify one's own purpose? Thank you for both the questions, and I'm so glad you are asking. Um, this is a very wise question, <laughs> very wise, because this is, this is the area we are talking about, yeah? Um, it would appear from your question, and it is true, that if, if you ask someone or people around you, have you found your purpose in life? 
Have you found your direction in life? Most people will humbly say on the spot, no, I haven't. Yeah? Now, despite that, it doesn't mean that they are not unha they are, they are unhappy. They can still be happy. But when we talk about, do you have a purpose in life? What is your meaning in life? We're asking for a deeper kind of happiness. We're asking for a transcendental, a spiritual kind of peace and contentment with ourselves and with everyone else. That comes from our awareness of our meaning of our lives, right? So I first want to acknowledge most people will humbly reply, no, it's not clear to me exactly what is my purpose and direction in life. So it is not a psychological ailment. It is just most of us never got to even get asked this question. Now, some of us ask this question of ourselves. My patients do towards the end of therapy when all their symptoms are over, yeah? And they're okay. And then they look at me with this funny expression on their face. So what do I do about life now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or in, 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 the, in the Buddhist stories, you know, there, there was a Buddhist monk who went off to, to uh, an island to meditate, meditate, and he comes back to the Buddha and says, okay, I think I've found enlightenment. What do I do now? And the Buddha laughed. The Buddha said, what do you mean? What do you do? Yeah. Obviously, if, if you've been enlightened, you know what to do. Yeah. So he was trying to tell the monk, obviously now you help others to be enlightened. Yeah. You leave the island and you spread your teachings from your own personal experience, right? So in the same way, I would say for each of us, let alone helping others, but first of all, help ourselves, for each of us to enhance, uh, we may have already identified, I like your use of the word, to enhance our ability to find out what is our purpose. What is our purpose? If it comes from good intentions, do it. And that is your purpose of life, basically, yeah? Now, this question comes up practically in life when we are in dilemmas, especially moral dilemmas, as I was referring to, yeah? Or even existential dilemma. Now, some people come and see me, Look, Dr. Tan, I'm already very successful. I've got a beautiful family. I've got three cars. I've got a swimming pool. Everything is going well, you know, and I should be happy, but I'm happy enough. But something is still missing in my life. Ah, that is existential lack, the existential anxiety that then touches on what's your meaning of life. And then that may be the start of their spiritual journey, yeah? And then that might lead them to talk to their priest. Sorry about the interruption. Yeah. So I would say that uh, we can help ourselves to uh, look at this question ourselves and it often arises at a critical moment, yeah? For most of us, we are already living a life that has the purpose of service, yeah? We are already uh, practicing like bodhisattvas. A lot of what we do, a lot of what we say is towards our moral ethical values and towards our purpose in life. And for many of us, our purpose in life is to be happy in ourselves and is also to help our family members and then our community to be happy. And that is good enough as a purpose, as um, our meaning in life. But 
in our profession, in the job that we do, sometimes in the many areas in our work, we might want to choose an area that helps us work towards such good intentions even more so. And then we find we go to work more enthusiastically, we enjoy our work much more because it's actually serving the good, the good in ourselves and the good in everyone else. So thank you for this very deep question that takes us from IQ to EQ to SQ and to wisdom. Our wisdom quotient can be increased in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pang Chenka, and uh, also Lo Mian. Thank you very much for all your contributions and, you know, in this morning session. Uh, I think that's basically come to the end of this morning session. So, I'm Mian. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the questions and the discussions as well. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you. Sadu, Sadu, Sadu. 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 Sadu.